a scholarship to do her PhD research with us here. And she's continuing work on salt tolerance uh, in rice. So, and she spent a year, actually in 2018, at Erie. So she'll present you know, what she did at Erie and then what she's doing now to wrap up her PhD. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Thompson, uh, for uh, introducing me, my supervisor, my mentor. And really, I'm grateful to him that he is always supporting me in all of my research activities. OK, so today I'm going to talk on investigating the molecular mechanisms of reproductive stage salinity tolerance in rice. So this picture actually the uh, screening uh, area of International Rice Test Institute. So we have a rain shelter to protect our plants from the salinity, like so protect our plants from the rainwater and to maintain the constant EC. So I'll discuss more, but this is the background picture for this. So uh, in this uh, presentation, I'd like to brief the background uh, and the objective uh, of my study, the methods I used in phenotyping and genotyping study, then I will highlight some of my results and finally summarize the key findings. So you all know that uh, rice uh, is an important crop that feeds half of the world's population and the productivity is adversely affected by various biotic and abiotic stresses. So salinity is one of the major challenge uh, to sustain the productivity and as well as the food security of the rice world, especially who are residing in the climate resilient uh, <coughs> coastal region. So to overcome this challenge, we need to produce more salt tolerant rice varieties or salt tolerant crops. And um, <coughs> my research is focused on more reproductive stage because it translates into grain yields. So sometimes we see that due to salinity, uh, plants are growing well, but when you get going to harvest, nothing. So fertility, I, I mean sterility is much more higher. So that's why my research is most focused on uh, reproductive stage. But there are very few studies conducted at reproductive stage. That's why uh, it is very, very urgent to develop salinity tolerance, particularly at this stage to maintain the food security of the rice world. So there are different salt tolerance as uh, this, my research is focused on salinity. So there are also some different mechanisms to uh, how protect, how the plants protect by themselves. So there are different mechanisms in those. I just pointed out some few points like sodium and efflux from root to rhizosphere, sodium and loading or unloading from the xylem, then sequestration into the vacuole. So this is the vacuole. So these are the sodium and can be sequestered in here and also leaf to leaf compartmentalization. And uh, there are different uh, oxidative and non-oxidative enzymes that reduce the effect of sodium ions due to this mechanism process. But this, these activities um, uh, are done by several genes. The major genes are like HKT, NHX, and SOS. Say for the HKT, uh, mainly the HKT they are involving in uh, Okay, start with NHX. NHX like sodium ion and hydrogen ion antiprotor activity, so they sequester it into the vacuole. So this is one gene. So HKT mainly involves loading and unloading into the xylem. Say this is a xylem vessel and this is a xylem parenchyma. So HKT gene is responsible for transporting sodium ion from xylem vessel to xylem parenchyma. So these are different mechanisms and different genes they are evolved for the salt tolerance. So since uh, conventional breeding takes a long time to uh, produce any tolerant crop, so in that case, QTL mapping makes faster, makes this process faster than the conventional breeding. And it also helps to dissect the molecular mechanisms involved in terms of salinity tolerance. Till today, uh, the single nucleotide polymorphism, that is SNP, is the most high throughput molecular marker. Uh, which is belong to the last generation molecular marker that occurs in higher frequencies in both plant and animal genomes. So the development of SNP markers, uh, which allows to automatize and um, enhance the effectiveness of the genotyping analysis. That's why in my study, I'm using SNP genotyping and I'm using two different platforms. That is one is KSP genotyping platform and another one is whole genome scheme sequencing platform for this study. 
So, the major objective of my study is to identify QTL for salinity tolerance, particularly at reproductive stage in rice, by using two backros one f 2 population with the salt tolerant parents. So, let's uh, stick on what I did in the materials and methods. Okay, so I use, uh, I went to Philippines uh, 2018 to conduct a, my phenotyping study. So, phenotypic screening and all other physiological parameters I finished in ERI and then I came back to Texas A&M 2019 and started my molecular work in here. So, this is the ERI picture and this is I think the agri-genomics lab. So, while I'm working there. Okay, so two plant materials I used. One is CSR28, which is from India, which is salt tolerant parents. And uh, second one is Hasawi, which is from Saudi Arabia. It's also another salt tolerant parents. And I'm using one common parents that is Birdhan28, which is from Bangladesh. And it's a mega variety of our country. So it has all good characters, except uh, it doesn't tolerate that much in salinity. And this is the crossing scheme we followed in Erie. So we crossed our recurrent parent with the donor and we got our F1. Then we back cross with uh, our recurrent parent, got the back cross one. Then we sell to get the back cross one F2. So the mapping population for my experiment is back cross one F2. Okay, so plant has a major two growth stages that is seedling and reproductive stage. So as my work is on reproductive stage, so my focus is to put salt on that stage. So reproductive as and this population is backross 1 F2. So this is highly segregating. So like after a certain period of vegetative states, say around 60 to 65 days, I have to keep track each and every day when the plants just enters into the reproductive state. Because uh, the point is we have to apply it at the right time. So when I say the, this structure coming out from the first plant leaf, that means my plants enter into the booting stage. And my target to apply salinity is on booting stage. So first PI, then booting. So the hardest part was there that as it is F2, so each and every plant behaves, I mean, uh, comes the booting stage in a different time. So yes, when I got this um, booting stage, first what I did, clip all the leaf samples or prune all the leaf samples except the flag leaf and the penultimate leaves. <coughs> and then uh, transport, transferred back into the saline water which was EC10 DS per meter for continuously 20 days. And uh, for continuously 20 days and after 20 days we shifted back to the normal water and allowed them to grow till the maturity. So this is the figure. So this is the uh, plant uh, which is under EC10 days per meter for continuous liquidity. This is the rain shelter. Uh, and after 20 days, we collect the first flag leaf uh, for measuring the sodium ion and potassium ion concentration uh, and their ratio. And uh, after, and wait till their maturity. And this is actually the salt tolerant plant and this is a salt sensitive plant. There is nothing when it is highly affected but there was really some good grains uh, when uh, this is actually tolerant plant after the leaf clipping also so there was no scope to compartmentalize the salt to 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 place on the older leaves so with the leaf clipping and leaf pruning it shows much more tolerant but this has actually no grain so this is the effect of the salinity so this is the and uh, after that we did, uh, when plants get mature, first we did the standard evaluation scoring, which was uh, 13579, which is developed by ERI uh, around 2013. So one stands for highly tolerant and nine stands for highly sensitive. This is actually a visual scoring to define a plant, okay, why this plant is salt tolerant and this plant is salt sensitive. Uh, it may vary, but it's actually a visual representation to define or identify a salt tolerant and salt sensitive plant. And after ACS scoring, other parameters I took, that is plant height, productive tillers, uh, pinnacle length, number of field spikelet, unfilled spikelet, and grain yield per plant. And uh, as this is uh, back cross one if two, so I took all of the individuals grain yield, all of the individuals plant height, productive tillers. So this is how I am done. I was done with my ED work. So basically collecting data and finish the screening of the 
टू पॉपुलेशन सी एस आर ट्वेंटी एट एंड ब्रिडिथान ट्वेंटी एट एंड हासावी एंड ब्रिडिथान ट्वेंटी एट सो सी एस आर ट्वेंटी एट एंड ब्रिडिथान ट्वेंटी एट आई स्टार्टेड इन द फास्ट पार्ट ऑफ द ईयर लाइक फ्रॉम मार्च टू ऑगस्ट और फेब्रुआरी टू ऑगस्ट एंड फ्रॉम द सेकेंड पार्ट आई डिड हासावी एंड ब्रिडिथान ट्वेंटी एट देन आई केम बैक टू टेक्सस एन एम एंड स्टार्टेड माई जेनो टाइपिंग वर्क सो वेन आई वॉज इन एरी सो वी कलेक्टेड ट्वेंटी फाइव old leaf samples and we lyophilize those leaf sample and uh, make a process made a process to transport it those samples from ed to texas a&m so then we selected actually 192 individuals from sorry from both population based on selective genotyping and also based on aps <coughs> and grain yields so we did the dna extraction with the uh, ctab method uh, Uh, CTAP method and for these two population we are using two different platform to identify SNPs. Uh, the first one we use the KSP genotyping and for the Hasawi and Birdhan 28 we use the scheme sequencing. So actually when we transported the leaf sample from ED to Texas A&M and when we finished the DNA extraction we saw some DNA quality issue. It was uh, uh, highly degraded so that's why we decided to go for this population uh, for the ksp genotyping and for this one it was pretty okay that's why we we did with the scheme so this is the issues going on during the transportation and that's why we are using ks ksp and it works well now okay so this is the ksp work uh, we use the cluster color software for this so initially we ordered like 160 marker from lgc um and then we did the first polymorphism test okay these markers are really polymorphic or not to go on a final screening then we when we started on the final screening that means one marker at a time with all of the 192 individuals and we see that 90 markers shows the polymorphism and still uh, i am working on that so i will design more markers uh within this month hopefully <coughs> so this is the work going on in the for the ksp genotyping and okay so i want to show few results uh, uh, for this so first i did the correlation analysis from the first population that is csr28 and bridithan28 so uh, this is actually little bit hazy but i'll just explain this is acs that is standard evaluation scoring this is plant height productive tiller panicle length number of field spikelet number of unfilled spikelet uh, percentage percent field spikelet percent unfilled spikelet and grain weight finally sodium and potassium and concentration so first we find very significant and negative correlation between acs and grain yield it is obvious because we know that uh, according to our my previous slide one stands for good i mean tolerant and nine stands for sensitive so yield higher means yield higher means that means the score is lower so that's why it shows like 76% error negative but very significant between grain yield and acs Okay, if we go to the number of field spikelet, as sali it is a salinity experiment, so spikelet fertility or spikelet sterility is a is an issue for this. So we still find very good correlation between number of field spikelet and grain yield, that is ninety seven point nine and seven percent, and also percent field spikelet and grain yield. So this is the correlation from the first experiment, that is uh, one Indian variety and one Bangladeshi variety. for the second one the hasawi and biridhan 28 same thing we found positive uh, sorry negative and significant correlation between acs and grain yield and also like number of field spikelet 93% with grain yield and percent field spikelet also show positive and highly significant correlation so from now onwards uh, i will show some of my results from the hasawi and biridhan 28 because csr 28 and Birdhan 20 is still continuing. So, so if we see the genotypic frequency for this, so as this is a back cross one population, so the frequency from the parent B that is recurrent parent is much higher than those other population. It's around more than 0.8. So yes, and if we see the genetic map, uh, so it is actually the physical position of the markers, and there are about 9,000. Sorry, yes, nine thousand one hundred and one markers. So I don't know, nine thousand markers are distributed 
like in 12 chromosome and these are the physical position of the chromosome basically i got this data two three days back so i did the initial filtering and uh, and i'm using it but i will filter it more and make it more clear but this is a very initial data that's yes, very just two three days i'm working on that so these are the 12 chromosome physical position of those markers okay so let's go to the qtl mapping so after qtl mapping uh, i got very good qtl uh, like LOD value is uh, more than 20 for plant height. We all know, just let me phrase it, LOD value 3 is considered as a good QTL. So it means that 3 or beyond 3 is considered as a good QTL or the location of the gene is present in, in those regions. So here in chromosome 1, we got uh, LOD value is more than 20. So even also in the SD1, that is semi-dwarf gene, that also has... Uh, it, that also that gene also present in chromosome but uh, present in chromosome one but this is my like two three days work i will search where is the location if it is matched then that will be a good result for this qtl so okay after plant height um, i tried with number of field spikelet and i got very good qtl in chromosome two that is around seven uh, and also in chromosome one so this is for the number of field spikelet but yes i have to clean more marker and filter more uh, and and at last I tried with grain yield uh, grain yield also I found good QTL in chromosome 2 and also uh, chromosome 1 also has good QTL and another one is around chromosome 8 so uh, but most the Lord value is higher in chromosome 2 so I considered this chromosome 2 may be a promising one because uh, grain yield uh, the number of field spike rate both are present on chromosome 2 so with this, so I would like to uh, point out like yes, ACS is the initial indicator and we found very uh, good uh, correlation between ACS and grain yield. Although it's a visual observation, sometimes it may vary, but it works for my experiment. So uh, we can say yes, so, uh, this is salt tolerant plant and salt sensitive plant. Number two, yield obviously is an ultimate stress indicator, whatever the ACS is, we have to see the yield because at the end we need, we need food. So we need more production. So yield is the ulti ultimate stress indicator. And from the QTL mapping, we saw that uh, uh, chromosome two, it shows good QTL, like LOD value uh, more than six for both number of field spikelet and grain yield. So we have to filter it out which markers are responsible for that and uh, obviously we'll screen any other candidate regions are nearby on, on that position. So finally those KTL with those markers uh, hopefully could uh, help to dissect the molecular mechanisms that will be involved in the salinity tolerance in rice particularly at reproductive stage. So with this I would like to thank Monsanto's Bichel Borlaug International Scholars Program for my funding and International Rice Research Institute for the research support, Texas A&M AgriLife Research, and obviously the Texas A&M University who really recruited me here as a PhD student. So with this, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Edward Rangi. Uh, he's the program director of our Bichel Borlaug program. Then Dr. Michael J. Thompson, my supervisor, my mentor, uh, uh, Ma'am Septi, uh, Dr. Septi. So she is uh, my co-supervisor uh, co of my uh, uh, dissertation program. Dr. Rathor Kirti and Dr. Lee Tarpley, my committee members, and Dr. R.K. Singh, he was the former e scientist, but he is now working in Dubai in the Biosaline uh, Org. And uh, Dr. Robert Vaughn, uh, uh, actually we both are working in the KSP genotyping, and he is the one who is teaching me how to do the KSP genotyping, and not only teaching, he mainly helped me how to overcome the troubleshoots, which is more important, so I'm really thankful to him for his uh, guidance. And Dr. Shishen Wang uh, for the bioinformatics analysis. And last but not the least, all of my lab mates who creates the favorable environment for doing this all of type, all, all work. And with this, thank you so much. And I'll be happy to answer any questions from the audience. Questions? What's the normal range of uh, uh, salinity level that uh, the most rice cultivars can tolerate? And uh, why do you choose 10 sesamins as your treatment in your study? Okay. Thank you for your question. So his question is, uh, what is the standard range of the salinity 
ECDS per EC and why I uh, choose 10 DS per meter. Okay. So uh, one thing I want to mention: if we compare with seawater, that is 50 DS and 10 DS, actually it's nothing. But in practical, uh, when you have the high tide and low tide. So initially the uh, soil contains around 10 to 15 ds per meter EC. I mean uh, I am comparing with my country condition because I am from the coastal belt. So as I considered like okay 10 ds probably pretty a standard amount uh, uh, for, for the salinity tolerance and as in this experiment I did the leaf clipping so I don't allow my plants to sink or to like place uh, the salt in any other older leaves directly to the reproductive organ. So I am expecting if they can survive, if they can tolerate at EC 10 days per meter on that pruning condition, so they might survive in the field condition. So that's why I choose EC 10 days per meter. And for the reproductive stage, those are very sensitive. So if they can survive at 10 days per meter, so probably we can conclude that okay, this is tolerant. But for the seedling stage, it might be more than 12. That's fine. Thank you. Next. So, how does arsenic uptake correlate with salt tolerance? No, uh, again, I'm sorry. How does arsenic uptake correlate with salt tolerance? Are they arsenic? Arsenic. Arsenic. Yeah. Arsenic. The R. Okay, arsenic uptake for. How does it relate to salt tolerance? Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Never forget, I don't know is the best answer. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. No. No, actually, I am. I am a phlogist. I am not. I know about arsenic, but that's why I'm asking. I'm working salt. Did I really hear arsenic? <laughs> but anyway, I'm not too much familiar on this topic, on arsenic. But I think, uh, I think, uh, for the salt and arsenic, this is totally a different parameter to measure on. I think so because I'm just focusing on the how uh, plant can accumulate the salt and how they can tolerate but not maybe the other parameters so i'm not uh, sure about this answer <laughs> but i'll be happy to get any comments <laughs> but just sometimes when you talk about uptake of one thing yeah. it so should it should involve different mechanisms because there like there are different mechanisms involved like aluminum tolerance like plants uptake different enzymes or uh, other things, but uh, this should be a different mechanism from the salt tolerant mechanism. Like salt tolerant has sodium ion uptake from xylem to phloem, then recirculate back. So this has different mechanisms. I think so, but I am uh, more confident on salt tolerance mechanism, how to uptake those. So, oh. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Did I? Well, if I understood it right, did you use cast markers to map the QTLs? Because yes. usually we use rat stick or GPS markers to do that, right? Yes. Yeah, we actually I, sent the DNA and was, they said the quality is not enough to do something. Oh, okay, so that's why you don't. We tried that first. Okay. Yes. Okay, okay. Well, yes. you know, it doesn't give you enough power to, to map a few deals, right? I know it's, uh, it doesn't have the multi, it doesn't multiplex that well. Yeah, it's a lot more work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so. yeah, that's why I'm still doing. Like okay, I'm, nice. I'm still working on that. Okay. I finished 90 even some of the some of the samples okay. amplifying some of now. So again, I'm doing. Okay. But basically, according to the phenotypic study, like yeah. visual study, CSR 28 and Beridhan 28, I have ever seen the best response. Okay. So I was expecting the good DNA, but somehow we have and, and an issue. Do you know how many markers you use to do this work? For cast? How many cast markers do you? Uh, 90 works, so probably we are gonna order 50 or 60 more. Okay. 50 or 60 more. Yeah, because you know, I know it's a lot of work when you use this platform. To yeah, work it's work. it's huge. It's a lot of work. Yes. Um, the other question is, you said you map the gene, you map the QTL on chromosome two for yield per se, yes. right? And yield is a combination of a lot of things. Yes. Everything in the, yes. that goes in the background of the plant. Yes. So. Can we really map a QTL for yield per se? Oh, yeah, that's a well, good question. Okay. But as I say, like yield is the stress indicator. 
ultimate so we need to focus because in in previous work also in the salinity work people try to get uh, the yield qtl so probably I, I am working on that i will work more what factors are involved in here and also i will try to match uh, if there is any yield qtl available on the same chromosome or same markers but i will work on more but yes, previous papers and previous works, they also try to find QTL in yield and number of field spikelet, particularly in the salinity tolerance experiment. I just want to add comment on that. So in ERI, for example, for drug tolerance, uh, the QTL mapping done by QTL under the drug. Okay. And they, okay. uh, I mean, make a lot of progress with that. Maybe it's a lot of priorities on that. So I guess in rice it's possible to like, get the QTL for like QTL. So I was going to ask you that regarding to the new QTL and probably is at time high QTL, do you see there's a pleiotropic effect? Or because you say there was one for a dwarfing gene, right? It was a chromosome yeah, or yeah. one? Yeah, actually I didn't check. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting because that load value is too higher. I have to check the marker and the position. So I have to check the exact region. As I said, I just, I'm just analyzing two days and I'm just presenting. So I will do it in, on further. So yeah. Um, so in the, the uh, coastal areas, is it normal to have water during reproductive stage that high up in the canopy? Yes, sometimes. D due to high tide and low tide, it sometimes happens. So that's why, uh, no, but nowadays, like Biri, Biri Bangladesh Rice Institute, they develop a lot of good varieties for salt tolerance. So they can survive, but still, yes, from the coastal zone I saw. Due to high tide, it, it, it has salt, and low tide, it goes, and it's like retains salt for a long time in the soil. Yeah, normally, the water is, is used quite much um, when it starts the flowering. And yeah, that things happen. Yeah, so due to actually like uh, the field which I have seen in my country, so when high tide came, this much water always be there, and then low tide, it's go gone. So. That's why, that's how the plants grow in there. So, but Biridhan uh, 58, 47, they behave very well. And Biridhan 28 actually is a very good variety. That's why we're trying to see how can we incorporate the salt range in over there. Thank you. I wanted to ask you a question about your pruning of the plants. Do you think by removing the old leaves, you took away one of the plant's defense mechanisms to sequester the salt? And do you think you missed some QTL maybe that deal with sequestration of that? Oh, and okay. do you think also pruning the plant, you damage the plant tissue, so you kind of imply another stress that could kind of confound some of your... Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, uh, <coughs> the flag, I, I said, like, I cut all the leaf samples except the flag leaf and the penultimate leaves. So flag leaf is the uh, reproductive, we, we said is the reproductive organ like it provides 80% yield from there. So if we even cut the older leaves, that doesn't much affect the yield quality or the, maybe it's not as a stress. It's a stress, but not as severe stress, like 20% or 10%, that's fine. So that's why we keep the flag leaf and penultimate leaf. Now, second thing, if we cut the leaf samples, so directly when you put the salt, it will never get scope to uh, what what's good, say relocate or translocate or take place into other older leaves better it will directly go to the reproductive organ there is no sink so that's why my objective is to cut uh, the leaf samples which are really not necessary which are really not responsible for the yield or will not affect the yield so we cut it so salt will directly go to the reproductive organ so it it, it will not hamper any QTL things for this Thank you. Other questions? A general question, is salinity tolerance related or correlated to drought tolerance? No. <laughs> no, these are two different, but some plants, yeah, some, some plants can tolerate salinity and some plants can tolerate drought together, but we cannot say that they are correlated. Like if one plant is salinity tolerant, we cannot define that, okay, this should be a drought tolerant. But some plants, like some wild plants, they are actually tending, okay, I, I, am, I am tolerating salinity, I am tolerating drought. But there is no correlation. I think so, but, but 
probably there is no correlation. So you mentioned in your presentation that during the transfer of the samples, uh, some were degraded and resulted in bad quality of the DNA. So what would you do to, if you had to repeat it again, how would you address this issue? Okay. Uh, best decision, transport DNA. No leaf samples, no lyophilized leaf sample. Transport DNA, extract DNA, fresh leaf samples, and then transport. DNA will not degrade. I think uh, although lyophilized leaf sample, they said it's not degraded, but it happens for me. So when I have this, when I extract this, when you see all of the samples are degraded or bad quality, it makes frustrating. But the good thing is we some recover this uh, through the KSP genotyping. But my best suggestion is to transport DNA. Other questions? All right, let's thank our speakers again.